On the evening of Sunday, January 3rd, 2016, Brenda Jackson was dropped off at her home in Park Forest, Illinois, after spending the day with her family. She spoke with her mother again that evening, but then was never seen or heard from again. Years have passed and the question remains, where is Brenda Jackson? Let's break down the details. On the evening of Sunday, January 3rd, 2016, Brenda Jackson was dropped off at her home where she lived alone in the 200 block of Arcadia Street in Park Forest, Illinois. She was dropped off by her father, Joel Gonzalez. This was sometime around 9 p.m. He told her goodbye, I love you, honey, I will see you tomorrow. About an hour and a half later, Brenda spoke with her mother, Maria Gonzalez, on her cell and told her that she was home alone. Some articles say her six kids were sleeping over her parents' home as they did not have school the next day. Others said it was the four of them sleeping over with one child at his father's home in Texas. And the youngest, an infant, was in a foster home as Brenda had lost custody of all her kids. Regardless, Brenda did have to work an early shift the next day and anyways did not have her kids at home. She was scheduled to show up at 5 a.m. to her job in the food service department at Rich South High School in Richland Park, Illinois. It's not made clear at what point in the day her family realized she was missing. What is clear is that Brenda did not report for work on Monday, January 4th. She was then reported missing two days later from the last time anyone saw her by her mother, Maria, and her husband of two and a half years, Antonio Jackson. There weren't many details made public about Brenda and her life. However, some of the few that were are concerning. At the time of her disappearance, she was in the middle of a contentious divorce with Antonio, who long had a history of domestic violence against her. Four months prior to her mysterious disappearance, in August 2016, a Cook County family judge ruled that all six of Brenda's children were wards of the state and awarded custody to the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services. As it turns out, Brenda had once again refused to press charges against Antonio after yet another bout of domestic violence. At that time in 2016, Brenda's children's ages ranged from about four months to 10 or 11 years old, depending on what source you read. One of Brenda's children was sent to live with his father in Texas. The infant was sent to One Hope United, a nonprofit foster home, and Brenda's parents, Maria and Joel, were allowed to care for the remaining four in their home. Brenda was allowed supervised visits with the children. However, Antonio was to have absolutely no contact whatsoever with them. Seizing this opportunity, Brenda separated from Antonio and secured her own place. Two months later, in October, she filed for divorce. At this point, Antonio was becoming unhinged at the fact that he was losing his grip and control over Brenda and their familial situation. He began to harass, stalk, threaten, and even tell Brenda he was contemplating suicide if she didn't return to be with him. Under the guise of wanting to mend their relationship, she told them that she also wanted to work out with him, but first she needed to get her kids back. That evening, in January, Joel dropped Brenda off at her home without knowing it was the last time he would see his daughter again. According to American Crime Journal, when Brenda's mother told Antonio she was about to go report Brenda missing, Antonio told her to wait because he wanted to speak with her first, then go with her to the police station. The article's author, Damien Moore, goes on to write, Abusers want to be portrayed in the best light possible and control the narrative. The link to Damien's article is listed below and it covers the very possible ugly truth of why Brenda's case did not receive the coverage it deserved. I highly encourage you to read it as it discusses crime reporting discrepancies that we're still currently facing in our media, despite this article being written three years ago. A search of Brenda's home revealed many of her personal items had been left behind, including purse, parco, and gloves. One article said her ID was left behind. Another said Park Forest Police announced that while the purse was still in the home, one piece of identification was missing. It would be interesting to know which ID was missing, whether a state driver's license or regular ID, or maybe even a veteran's ID, as Brenda had previously served in the army. The mentioning of the coat and gloves are important because it was wintertime. I went on Google and typed January weather Park Forest, Illinois, and it said that the average for the month was a high of 30 degrees Fahrenheit with a low of 14 degrees. So she certainly would have not stepped out without some kind of warming layer. The house appeared to be undisturbed with no evidence to explain her disappearance or even any signs of a crime having happened. Park Forest Police Department Sergeant Darren Studer said even though there were allegations of domestic violence against the husband, police aren't ready to call him a suspect in Jackson's disappearance. Studer was quoted as saying, I mean, Everybody to me would be a suspect at this point, but obviously he was one of the last people who had seen her and he lived with her, 
So, yeah. So, yeah. But did Antonio live with her? Didn't she have her own place? Why was he one of the last few people who had seen her? When? In what regard? And to what effect? Questions that, years later, we still don't have the answers to or have not been made public. Shortly after the disappearance, about 100 family members and friends of Brenda headed to search a forest preserve in South Suburban Park Forest through the freezing cold and snow to look for clues in her disappearance. This preserve, known as the Sock Trail Woods, is very close to Brenda's home and has a large lake as well as a lot of steep wooded areas, which made the search difficult during the winter. Many of the family and friends, this time accompanied by police canine units, returned to the preserve for another look a handful of days later. They came up empty both times. Now, I'm a bit confused about the timeline on this next part, because I haven't been able to find several sources to compare. I only found two. One source, American Crime Journal, states that eight days after Brenda's disappearance, Maria received an anonymous call from someone who told her she might find Brenda at a Cook County Forest Preserve near her home. Maria notified Park Forest Police, but instead was told they had received reports of two sightings of Brenda in the Chicago area and would instead focus on that lead. It appeared that one person who came forward felt that they were absolutely certain that they had seen Brenda in Chicago. Authorities had been trying to pull the surveillance footage so that Brenda's family could confirm if it was her. There was no update to this surveillance footage detail, so if police were able to secure the footage, it appears that it was not Brenda on tape. I wonder if this individual who came forward was questioned about what they saw. Was the female they saw alone? What was she wearing? Was she holding anything? How did she look? Anxious, calm, disheveled. Where was Antonio when this call came in? Just wondering. Another source. The Chicago Tribune implies that this anonymous call and search happened closer to mid-July and that the search occurred in an overgrown vacant village-owned lot in an industrial park along Holly Street from North Street to South Street, which is overrun with scrub trees, bushes, and tall grasses and is just a little over a mile from Brenda's home. Maria said that this particular area was not searched in January, and eerily enough, family members later noticed this exact area in a background of a photo of Brenda. Regardless of whether it happened in January or July, that area was searched for signs of Brenda and produced no results. I wish we also knew more details about this anonymous caller. I understand how that sounds like an oxymoron. I mean, was it a male or a female voice? Did they block the number? If not, was the number looked up? Did they use one of those voice changers? What did they say verbatim? Nearly three weeks after Brenda's disappearance, the five children that resided in Park Forest were removed from the home of Maria and Joel. They apparently violated the court order, which had provided Brenda supervised visits and absolutely no contact with Antonio. It appeared that the only reason why they allowed Antonio to come over and see his kids was that they believed that he had something to do with Brenda's disappearance and they thought by keeping him close, they would get some clues as to what he did with her. This was confided by a family friend to American Crime Journal's Damian Moore. I can't understand, Maria Gonzalez retorted. These DCFS reports say that these children are in a loving, happy environment. If you say that in your reports, then why are you taking these kids and putting them with strangers? In a statement to NBC Chicago, DCFS said, We have concerns about the grandparents' willingness to accept the severity of the dynamics of this case, and the impact that this has on their ability to provide a safe home for the children. Therefore, we will be moving the children to a home that can ensure the safety and well-being of the children long-term. Joel was quoted as saying, We take care of these kids. Now they want to separate them. Put them with totally different strangers. Maria and Joel said that they would fight this decision. I might be reading too much into this, but I was wondering why Brenda shared with her mother that she was alone. Not many details are known about this case, so I don't know if she might have had friends possibly coming over or if she was going to meet with someone later at her home. I don't know. If Brenda was going through this divorce, meaning she had already been separated and living apart from Antonio and all six of her kids were out of the home, why did she feel the need to state that she was alone? Wouldn't that have been implied? I've tried to reflect on when I've been home alone because my husband's been deployed or away at trainings and when I've spoken to my mom or sister on the phone, I've never stated I'm alone. It's implied. There's no one at home with me other than my dog. Could maybe someone have been in the home with Brenda while she was talking on the phone with her mom and she had to say something to that effect to assure whoever might have been inside that she wasn't going to try and tip her off? Did her mom 
call Brenda or did Brenda phone her mom? I've only just read that they were on the phone together sometime around 10.30 p.m. Brenda is an army combat vet, having done a tour in Iraq. I wasn't able to find much about her service record, but I do have another question. There are different ways service members can separate from the military, whether by choice, being forced out, retirement, or medically. Brenda was only 31 at the time of her disappearance, so I don't think she was longevity-based retired from the army, meaning that she had put in at least 20 years of service. She may have willingly separated or medically retired. These details wouldn't really be known to us unless the family made that public. Essentially, I'm wondering if Antonio is securing VA benefits from her disappearance. Without getting into too much technical information, service members that are 180 to 90 days out from separating or retiring from the military can file for VA disability through the Benefits Delivery at Discharge or BDD program. Service members who did not file a claim while in service can still file a claim after separating. The point is, this type of disability is for veterans only and it deals with service-connected issues and injuries to include mental health claims. According to Title 38, Chapter 1, Part 3, Subpart A of the Code of Federal Regulations, when any veteran has disappeared for 90 days or more and his or her whereabouts remain unknown to the members of his or her family and the Department of Veterans Affairs, disability compensation which he or she was receiving or entitled to receive may be paid to or for his or her spouse, children, and parents, effective the day following the date of last payment to the veteran if a claim is received within one year after that date, otherwise from the date of receipt of a claim. It might be interesting to see if Brenda ever filed for VA disability and was receiving benefits, and if so, were those benefits redirected after her disappearance? We know she filed for divorce, but at no point did I read it was finalized, and many of the articles still refer to Antonia as her husband. Not her estranged husband, or husband whom she was separated from, just husband. So, could Antonia be possibly financially benefiting from this situation? The theories for Brenda's disappearance range from postpartum depression, as her youngest was only four months at the time of her disappearance, to PTSD from her time as a combat vet. I've also read theories that she just went into hiding from Antonio and may reemerge later. It's hard to theorize from such little details we've been provided. There's been no coverage on this case, except her parents repeatedly pleading for assistance from authorities. Maybe she did go into hiding and will reemerge once her children are older and safer. Maybe someone from her unit or a close friend helped her go into hiding. Maybe she had been planning this for some time, which may explain why her personal belongings were untouched. How far back had her bank statements been checked? Was she paid by cash, check, direct deposit? Were there any odd purchases or amounts withdrawn? Is it really so hard to imagine something like this could be planned? I understand she loved her children with all her might. Perhaps it's because she loved them so much that she thought that this would be the best course of action to protect them. Maybe she did have postpartum depression. Maybe she did have PTSD. Maybe Antonio did do something to her. Was he cleared? Did he have an alibi for that night? What is he even up to these days? We don't know. We don't know anything at all because this case seems to have frozen in time. ABC7 Chicago published an article on September 24, 2021, still echoing her parents' pleas for any kind of update in this case. They're upset, understandably, not only because it feels like they've been left hanging without updates, but because as a minority woman, Brenda is more likely to have received less coverage, resources, and coverage on current case updates than a white woman would. According to the article's conclusion, ABC7 reached out to Park Forest Police for an update. Park Forest Police Chief Christopher Menino responded to their inquiry, stating that the Gonzalez-Jackson case is of high importance, and they're consulting with the FBI. I also couldn't find any recent information explaining if custody of the children had been returned to Maria and Joel, or if the kids ended up being placed into a different home, or homes. Despite Joel having opposite thoughts, Maria has stated that she no longer believes her daughter is alive. All she wants is closure, for herself, for her grandchildren, for her family, and to put her daughter to rest. On August 25th, 2018, Community United Effort and the family of missing person Jerrica Laws held an event in remembrance of Jerrica. Jerrica also went missing near Park Forest, Illinois, a few months before Brenda disappeared. Jerrica's mother, Chantanel, was able to reach out to Maria so that she could participate in the event. I don't presume to know what was spoken about at the event, though I am sure it covered Jerrica, the number of individuals missing in their community, Brenda, and 
efforts to keep their cases alive. There was a photo of Chantanel holding Maria as Maria held a microphone, visibly upset. The caption read, Two mothers that share the same heartache. Our daughters are missing, Jericho Laws and Brenda Jackson. At this time, investigators do not believe the cases to be linked despite their geographical proximity. Brenda is Hispanic and about 5 feet tall, weighing 125 pounds with black hair and brown eyes. She has a scar on her upper chest and star tattoos on both sides of her neck, as well as a tattoo on her ring finger and a tattoo of the name Michael on her inner left wrist. If you have any information on Brenda, please contact Q Center for Missing Persons at 910-343-1131, their 24-hour tip line at 910-232-1687, or Park Forest Police 708-748-1309. All information submitted to Q Center for Missing Persons is confidential. 